in elementary school, I had the privilege of attending a Christian school. It was a small little school in our town that my mom uh, sent me to, and uh, once a week we had a chapel service. Uh, most weeks a local pastor or youth speaker would come in and share a message, uh, a lesson from the Bible. And uh, I was never, as a youngster, too into these chapel services. But once a month, we'd have the chapel service where the vice principal of the school would lead the service. And he would uh, get up there and he would uh, do an object lesson. It, it was quite simple. Uh, but once a month, he would choose a class, uh, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. And we, on the spot would have the opportunity to present to him any random object. It was, it was exciting. Uh, we, we loved it. And obviously, the, the mission of those chapel services were tr to try to stump our vice principal. Because he would take that object and he would use it as a springboard to go to the scriptures and teach us something about God, about ourselves, about Jesus. Now, I don't have the best memory when it comes to my grade school years, but there, I remember vividly the day that he called on our class to present a random object. Um, uh, Mr. Hoffman called on our class and we scrambled. It was like this moment of mayhem where we all turned to each other. You know how in every classroom or every uh, place in society, there's like the mayor. There's the person who's in charge, the leader of the class. And so hey, that wasn't me. And so we, we turn to him and we say, oh, wh what are we going to give him? And, and, and so we search our pockets. We pull out some pens, some pencils, some lint. Like we, we're just, it's, it's all been done before though. This, this has been going on for a while. And um, Danny, who's the mayor of the class, turns to me and he says, hold still, Peter. And he grabs my head, takes a piece of hair, plucks it out. And uh, Danny stands up. He says, I got it. And he goes up to Mr. Hoffman, puts it in his hand. And there's my hair in Mr. Hoffman's hand. I'm like, ow, that hurt. And I'll never, never forget. Never forget that moment. As he turned to Luke 12, 7, and he said, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Do not be afraid. And he, and he went on to, to share how God knows the number of hairs on our head, that I have one less now. Luke 7 says, you are worth more than sparrows. God cares for the sparrows. He cares for the lilies of the field. And, and I, I don't have a lot of memories from my elementary school years. Like, I barely remember the, the classrooms, but I remember that day. And I think part of it is, is there is power in an object lesson. You know, where, when you connect something tangible that you experience with something uh, more abstract, in, intangible. And, and that's the power of an object lesson. You'll notice that some of the best teachers will use object lessons to connect uh, truth with something we already know. On a regular basis here in the church, we celebrate something that on face value is an object lesson. We take bread and a cup, and we celebrate together the meaning of Jesus' death. Uh, we call it the Lord's Supper. Uh, in fact, we, we modeled this practice after uh, Jesus modeled it for us in Matthew 26. And it says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness 
of sins. Now on face value, this seems like Jesus is making an object lesson. It almost seems like he's, he's taking whatever is there on the table, kind of like Mr. Hoffman did in our little elementary school chapels, and, and making a, an object lesson out of a random meal. Well, there was nothing random about this meal. Jesus and his disciples were celebrating something that was ingrained in their DNA. The Jewish people were celebrated the Passover. And, and a historic event which year after year they had a meal where this bread and this cup represented something historic. Something deeply meaningful. We're continuing this morning in a series which we have called Trajectories of Grace. And we see all throughout Scripture, we began in Genesis chapter 3 and moved to Genesis chapter 12. And as we see the story of God unfolding throughout humanity, one of the things we see is that the grace of God is nothing new when we come to Jesus. It's something set into motion from the dawning of time. See, God is gracious in His character. He is uh, constitutionally generous. He is a God who loves to relentlessly show His kindness to you and me. And so one of the things we see is that this bread and this cup are more than an object lesson. In fact, they are part of a trajectory of grace that began long before in the history of Israel. It's more than an object lesson. It's a tangible experience of a historical story of God's grace. But through the cross of Jesus, it's no longer historical but it becomes personal. And this is where the trajectory of grace, what we're going to do this morning is we are going to celebrate together the, the meaning of this bread and this cup. But what we're going to do is we're going to go backwards this morning. Because what we find is, is the trajectory of grace that began long before in the history of Israel, that Jesus, when he picks up that bread and that cup with his disciples, he is giving a whole new meaning to the trajectory of grace. You see, this bread and this cup remind us that the trajectory of God's grace doesn't end at the cross. It meets us here and propels us to tomorrow. So let's go together to the origin of the Passover meal, a story of deliverance that is remarkably similar to our own stories. And I want us to consider this morning how the Passover lamb is a picture of grace that helps us understand what this bread and this cup represents. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to open up to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And as we turn there, we see here... Uh, the story of the people of Israel. Uh, it's, it's a story that has progressed since we last looked at it in Abraham's life, where God made a promise to Abraham that he would bless him, and through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God gave this promise that he was going to develop this nation into a, a a place where God was going to move. And it, well, through them, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And, and the nation of Israel, as we read throughout the book of Genesis, it, it, they end up having to go to Egypt because of a famine in the land. And so they go to Egypt and are really taken under the care of the Egyptian authorities. But over time, they became slaves of the Egyptian people. In the beginning of Exodus, um, we have this moment where 
the people are in distress. Um, and they cry out to the Lord. Um, in Exodus chapter 2, we read this. During a long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites, and he was concerned about them. He cared. And in this story, as the story of Exodus unfolds, God calls Moses to go to Pharaoh and go, Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Whoa, baby, let my people go. And, and, and God uses Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, I, I, I'm going to deliver these people. And Pharaoh is resistant. And as the book of Exodus unfolds, it, you, you may remember uh, the story of plagues, where God sends plagues on the land as a sign that he is in control. That these are his people and he's going to follow through with delivering them. And as we get to Exodus chapter 12, Pharaoh has been resistant. He won't let the people of Israel go. And so God says, I'm sending one final plague on the land. I'm going to kill all the firstborns. I'm going to send through the angel of death who is going to kill every firstborn child and uh, livestock, no, no firstborn among the land is going to survive. But this is what he says to the people of Israel. Exodus chapter 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household, if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people that are there. And as the passage goes on, he tells them to take this lamb and they are to slaughter it. It's a, to be a lamb without any blemish. A perfect lamb. And they are to slaughter it and to take the blood of that lamb and to put it on their doorposts. To put it on the sides, over top, and both sides, and that the blood of this lamb would be a substitute. That that night, as death would come through the land of Egypt, whoever put that blood on their doorposts would be spared. That lamb is a picture of grace. Grace. Oh, one of the things that we see as Jesus and his disciples are celebrating this Passover meal. This meal that the, God commanded the people of Israel to celebrate year after year. This meal to remember the day of their deliverance from slavery. Is one of the things that we see is is that this bread and this cup represent uh, more than uh, simply Jesus' sacrifice. That they're grounded in the historic working of God's grace for the people of Israel, here, specifically here in the land of Egypt, on the day when God passed over those households. And so... What I'd like for us to do in the next few moments before we come to the table is to reflect on four ways that the Passover, this Passover lamb that became a substitute for the deaths in the land of Egypt, that how that gives us a picture of the meaning of this bread and this cup. And the first thing that we see is that the Passover meal and the Lord's Supper are both a remembrance of a bitter past of slavery. They are a remembrance of a bitter past of slavery. All throughout Scripture, 
especially the Old Testament, God gives a command to the people of Israel after he delivers them from Egypt. Don't forget the land of Egypt. Don't forget that time that you were in slavery. Why? Because when God works, when God moves in our lives, uh, we, we forget. We forget what he delivered us from. And we forget the meaning, the, the significance of his grace. And we forget that that grace is still at work in our lives today. And so part of what we do when we take this bread and this cup is we remember a bitter past of slavery. You, in the description of the meal that, that God commands the people of Israel to celebrate, is he tells them to take bitter herbs to represent that bitter time in slavery. They were to taste these herbs. And remember how they groaned in, under the oppressive rulers of the land and how God heard and God knew. When we come to the table and celebrate the Lord's Supper, we remember that we too apart from Jesus, are slaves of sin. And sin is an awful slave master because it is enticing and it wants to rule over us. But what Jesus does is he, he hears us and he knows what's best for us. And he sent Jesus to deliver us from that slavery. And so when we come to the table and celebrate the bread and the cup, we remember our slavery. We remember that sin enslaves. But the Passover meal and the Lord's Supper are also a celebration. They're a celebration of a new beginning. One of the things I love about the Passover story here in Exodus 12 is that God commands the people of Israel that they are to have a new calendar. They are to start their calendar afresh with the moment of Passover. And so on the 10th day of the first month, they are to celebrate the day when God passed over the households that were marked by the blood of a lamb. And, and this, so there in Exodus chapter 12, he says, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of the year. In, in the ancient Near East, uh, each culture had their own uh, calendars in which they had a beginning point where they started their year. And what God wanted Israel to realize is that this moment, the deliverance that God brings is a new beginning. And as we come to the table this morning and celebrate the bread and the cup, one of the things we realize is that this is a celebration of a new beginning. That in Jesus, whoever has put their faith in Jesus, uh, Scripture says you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We celebrate a new beginning, that our new life in Christ is really a new birthday. It's a new uh, season. It's a new uh, life. We are born again by the blood of Jesus, and this is a celebration. I, in my experience growing up in the church, the Lord's Supper was always a uh, sobering thing. And I, I think in... Rightfully so, because we remember our bitter past. And we recognize, we realize the sacrifice, but it is also a celebration. This bread and this cup marks new life. This is a birthday celebration. And that's what the Passover meal became for the people of Israel became this moment, this, this regular celebration of deliverance that God delivers from slavery. 
And so uh, the Lord's Supper and the Passover are both a remembrance of a bitter past of slavery. They're a celebration of a new beginning. And third, the Passover and the Lord's Supper are a realization of the cost of freedom. And this is part of what is sobering about this, the Lord's Supper, is that we realize the cost of freedom. You see, God commanded the people of Israel to take the door frame, and they were to take the blood of that lamb, and they were to mark the side of the door frame. They were to mark the top of that door frame. And they were to visibly see an object lesson that the cost of freedom is death. You see, one of the trajectories that we see that began in the garden is the trajectory that sin demands death. And God proclaimed it to to Adam and Eve there in the garden. That the the consequences of sin is death. And Paul picks up on it in Romans 3.23 and says the wages of sin are death. All of sin, Romans 6, 23, all, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, and the cost of freedom is a substitute. And, and one of the things that, that, that during the Passover, that night when, when the angel came through the land and killed all the firstborns, is the people had to believe that the blood of a lamb would be their substitute, would be their sacrifice, would be the death in place of theirs. And so one of the things that we celebrate and we realize is that The cost of freedom is death. And that, my friends, is what we celebrate at the cross. That the cost of your freedom from a bitter past of slavery is the blood of a lamb. This uh, picture uh, painted in the 1500s is um, one of my favorite paintings. Um, it's a picture of a bound lamb. It's a Spanish artist. Um, picture of a lamb bound for slaughter. It takes us back to the Passover night when the people of Israel took that lamb, slaughtered it, put its blood on the door frame, but it also takes us to Jesus, when John, John the Baptist proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, takes us to the hill of Golgotha, where we see Jesus. Isaiah tells us he was led to slaughter like a lamb. The cost of freedom is death. And that is one of the things we realize in the Lord's Supper. And so the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of a bitter past of slavery. It's a celebration of a new beginning. It's a realization that the cost of freedom is death. And finally, both the Passover and the Lord's Supper are an anticipation of future grace. And this, my friends, is where the trajectory of grace that began long ago in history leads us to the cross, but it doesn't stop there. It reminds us that God is still a God of grace. And he is outworking that grace in our lives. And he gives us an anticipation. Sometimes we call it hope that better things are yet to come. You see, 
one of the things that we see in Exodus chapter 12 is the people put that blood on the doorposts and as they waited and trusted that the substitute would be sufficient is that that was just the beginning. As the story unfolds, we're going to look at next week, God is going to deliver the people out of the land miraculously, but not just that, now they're just out of slavery. They don't have a home. They don't have a land of their own. And they have to trust God for years in the wilderness to lead them to their new home. You see, the Passover became a celebration of new beginning, but it also became an anticipation that God was going to continue to be a God of grace. That, tra that the trajectory of grace doesn't end here, that it continues, and that there is more that God wants to do in your life and mine. And so one of the things that we do when we take this bread and this cup and we break it, we remember, but also we anticipate. We look forward to what God wants to do in our lives tomorrow. When you get up, and you get ready for work, or you start your day by doing chores around the house, we believe that God is continuing this trajectory of grace. And He is changing us from one degree of glory to another, and He is giving us this anticipation that one day He's going to return, that He's going to make everything right. And Jesus tells the disciples there when He's breaking the bread with them and giving them the cup, He says, I tell you, I'm not going to eat of this bread or drink of this cup again until the kingdom. Until I eat of this bread and drink of this cup with you in the kingdom and we, as, as the people of God, when we take this bread and we take this cup, we are believing that there is still grace to be received. That God is still working. That He's not finished with you yet. That He wants to to mold you into the shape of Jesus, that He wants to work in your life. God isn't finished with you yet, and this meal, this bread, this cup, is an anticipation of future grace, that one day we will sit at a table with Jesus. And He is going to break this bread. And He is going to hand it to you. And say, eat to your heart's delight. Drink to your heart's delight. Because this meal is in anticipation that the trajectory of grace continues to this day. Church, God's not finished with you yet.